open JDK project called Project Loom. Uh, nothing I say here is a promise. Okay, so Project Loom aims to add fibers and continuations to the JVM. So a fiber is a thread. Um, that's the uh, best and really only way to think of it. Uh, but it's, uh, generally, we reserve the name fiber or uh, user mode thread for threads that are not managed by the operating system kernel, but by some runtime, the language runtime. And uh, the, reason the reason we want to have them is that they're uh, lightweight. We can have millions of them, uh, so both in terms of uh, uh, RAM overhead and in terms of task switching costs, uh, they're much um, lighter weight than, than uh, kernel threads. And the reason we want to do this now is that um, user sessions uh, speaking to the servers are getting longer. Um, so you don't just uh, connect, get an HTML page and, and disconnect. Uh, and that means that servers experience a larger number of concurrent uh, open connections. And if you write code uh, running on ordinary uh, Java uh, servlet containers, um, you, you'll find that you spend much of your time uh, just blocking, uh, and uh, the CPU, CPU utilization is uh, actually very, very low. So uh, these are graphs from actual, uh, actual production systems. Uh, so the servers get uh, underutilized, and developers in general have uh, two options today. So they can either write uh, very simple code uh, where they sign a single thread uh, for each connection, or any any kind of domain level concurrency unit, so it's a, a connection or a, a, a session or a transaction, uh, or but but in that case the the OS becomes a bottleneck because uh, a modern server can serve uh, over a million open TCP sockets, but uh, only a few thousand uh, active threads. Uh, and so uh, what other people do is that they write uh, uh, asynchronous code, uh, which makes everything much more complicated, both in terms of writing the code, reading the code, debugging the code, profiling it. Uh, and a big problem with asynchronous code is that um, it is completely non-interoperable with blocking code. Uh, so if you have legacy blocking code and uh, new asynchronous code, th there's just no sane way of, of, uh, of composing them. And we want to take that uh, hard decision away and to let people write ordinary, familiar, simple code, uh, even legacy code, uh, but in a way that's also scalable. So you'll have the same performance characteristics as, um, as asynchronous code, uh, but it would look much simpler. Uh, and uh, it can, uh, doing that, it can actually uh, translate to actual savings because you can uh, utilize uh, your servers much more. Uh, you can serve many more connections from a single server and uh, consume fewer servers. So this is the main motivation of the project. Um, so uh, removing this, this, um, this choice between uh, performance or scalable code and simple code, uh, and it also enables new kinds of um, Programming styles, I'll show a few. Um, so the language runtime is at, it's like, why can't we do this at the OS level? So the language runtime is actually better positioned to schedule your threads uh, for several reasons. Uh, one of them is that the operating system needs to, the, the, the threads in the operating system, they, their scheduling needs to support many different kinds of workloads. Uh, and the behavior of a thread that's serving transactions is very, is very different from the behavior uh, of threads that, say, uh, is playing a video or, or encoding a video. And uh, the OS needs to serve all these kinds of workloads uh, equally well, uh, but the language runtime has, uh, you can have more control and, and knows more about what you want to do. Uh, and at least the fibers we're aiming for are uh, going to be optimized for this uh, transactional behavior, which means that these are threads that run for a little bit. Uh, maybe they get a message, they wake up, they run for a little bit, uh, they wake something else up, uh, and then they block again. So something that runs for a little bit and blocks very, very often, and you can have millions of those. Um, so here I just want to show one of the reasons why the OS can't do this very well. 
Um, so of course, part of the, the cost of task switching through the OS is, is by switching to kernel mode and back. But even if that, and that maybe is a very significant portion of the cost, but even uh, if that weren't there, just to show some, some fundamental problems. So suppose we have uh, two threads that share some data. Uh, so here, I'm going to talk about locks, uh, data that's shared through locks, but message passing is exactly the same. So instead of locking on, and unlocking, think of it as uh, sending and reading a message. So we have this uh, guarded variable x, and uh, a thread wants to write to it, a, thre a thread wants to read from it. And uh, let's say that the thread a that wants to write to it obtains the lock first. So um, what it's going to do, it's going to grab the lock, write the value for x, and then it's going to see which threads are now waiting uh, on this lock. It's going to grab one from the list, and it's going to ask the OS to, to wake it up, and that's going to be B. Now, uh, if you're the operating system, and thread A is running on core 1, and you ask it, please wake, uh, wake B up, um, it's very unlikely that it was scheduled B on the same core as A, because as far as the OS knows, a is not relinquishing the CPU. Uh, it may want to now encode a video on the same on the same core. So what it's going to do is going to schedule B on a separate core, and that means that already you have some uh, cross-core synchronization going on. Uh, but the very first thing that B is going to do, again, whether it's a lock or a message, it's going to read the the, the data, the value that A is written, uh, and that is not going to be on the CPU local cache. So it's a guaranteed cache miss here. Um, but if you assume that threads have this transactional behavior that they run for a bit, they wake someone else up, and then they block again, uh, you can say, so if A has just asked me to uh, wake B up, it is very likely that it's going to block soon. So instead of scheduling B immediately in a separate core, you can just wait. Uh, you can put B uh, in some waiting list, uh, uh, processor local waiting list, uh, and wait for A to block. Uh, and when it does, uh, you just run B in the same core, and all the data is going to be hot in cache. Uh, and if your assumption is wrong, then you hope that uh, a, different, uh, a different CPU is going to steal that task. And of course, this kind of uh, scheduling is called work stealing uh, scheduling. And it's very efficient for this kind of behavior. Uh, it's not so good for uh, threads that, that, that encode videos. Uh, and uh, in Java, we already have an excellent uh, work stealing scheduler. That's the fork join pool and we can use that. Now, uh, I mentioned we're adding a new kind of thread. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the, the, how it's going to look to the users. So one option is to just reuse the existing thread class. And in fact, that is the one we're currently leaning towards. Uh, so if you uh, just create a new thread as you normally do today, you'd get an ordinary heavyweight kernel thread but you could pass to it something like a thread scheduler, or just a flag says, please make it lightweight, uh, in which case it's going to be uh, a lightweight thread. Uh, another option is to use a separate class for heavyweight threads and lightweight threads uh, with some common uh, abstraction, uh, which here is called strand. Um, so say you want to uh, write uh, an efficient uh, HTTP server, uh, in this example, I'm assuming that the fiber class is named fiber rather than thread. Uh, so you do it just uh, naively. Uh, and that's what Go people do, and that's what Java people used to do. Uh, so you have a single thread that just looping, accepting connections, and for every new incoming request, uh, it's going to uh, spawn a new thread. Um, and th all this code here is simple blocking code. Uh, but because it uses fibers, uh, it's going to behave uh, as if it were asynchronous, and you can have millions of those, uh, and the cost is going to be negligible. So we want people to write this naive code and to have it behave very well. Uh, under the covers, it's going to uh, use asynchronous uh, uh, I.O., but from the user's perspective, everything here is blocking. Uh, and the goal here is to run as much Java code as possible, especially code that runs uh, on uh, servlet containers. Uh, and uh, hopefully they can be virtually unchanged. In some experiments, you can have like a 5x or a 10x uh, increase in uh, throughput just by asking the serverless container uh, to use fibers instead of, instead of threads. Uh, of course, it doesn't help with the latency, but, it, but you can have many more concurrent connections. Now, uh, many modern uh, IO libraries, because we didn't have fibers, we still don't, um, 
they make use of uh, asynchronous API, so they have this callback. So say you have some asynchronous operation, you pass it a callback, and the callback can uh, complete uh, either successfully or it can fail. So uh, let's say you already have uh, an existing I.O. library um, that exposes this kind of asynchronous API. So transforming this into a fiber-friendly one, a blocking one, is, is very simple. We can add uh, to the JDK this class called async to blocking, uh, and it masquerades as the callback, uh, but when it succeeds or fails, when it terminates, all it does is it unparks the, the thread that's blocking on it. Um, so it's very easy to transform asynchronous code to blocking code, or non-blocking code to blocking code. Um, and of course, for all the JDK uh, I.O. itself, it's going to already work like this. Uh, but this is for third-party libraries. And the way you're going to use it, uh, so you wrap this asynchronous API with a synchronous API. Uh, and here, where you want to uh, register the callback, you would use that class, um, and uh, you would pass the current, the current uh, fiber, and you'd call run, and run will just uh, register the callback block, and when that callback terminates, it's going to unblock it and either throw an exception if something went wrong or return the result uh, synchronously. Um, once we have fibers, uh, we can support new kinds and simple and interesting kinds of programming. For example, channels like in Go. Uh, so channels are basically blocking queues, but they have all sorts of interesting operations like select. So you can block in multiple queues at once. Uh, data flow, I'm going to show an example of that. It's like uh, uh, spreadsheet programming, actors, uh, uh, like in Erlang, and something very interesting. You may want to look it up, something called uh, synchronous programming, which I think is the future, but uh, that's a whole different talk. Uh, fibers, and uh, so this is an example of, of, uh, of channels. Um, here you just receive a block uh, and receiving from a channel, and here you send one. And uh, regardless of whether we reuse the thread class for fibers or not, uh, you'd be able to uh, communicate from heavyweight threads and not lightweight threads on the same channels, on the same locks. Uh, so it's going to be quite agnostic. Uh, here's an example of data flow. So data flow, like I said, it's like a spreadsheet. Um, so here you have these uh, uh, single assignment variables called val and multiple assignment variables called var. And VARs can have uh, formulas attached to them, uh, just like in Excel. Uh, and the thing is that getting this to work with fibers is actually very, very simple. Uh, all you do is that the get operation is blocking. You make it blocking, and all the, all the um, uh, um, dependency graph is actually stored in the list of threads that are now waiting uh, on, this, um, on this blocking operation. Uh, so you basically get all the dependencies for free. Um, so uh, you can even, so, so I, I, I mentioned that it's all blocking and you pull data out and you block, but you, it doesn't mean that you can't apply uh, these functional transformers. So you can take a channel and add a filter to it and mapping and all that, but instead of uh, having the, the, the stream push data to you, uh, you pull uh, the data and everything is lazy. I think that for uh, imperative languages, uh, it's much nicer to work like this. Uh, another thing what we want to do is to have these lightweight threads serializable. Uh, and that means that you can have a thread running. Uh, it blocks in some operation. For example, it wants to read something from a database, uh, at which point it's a distributed database, and the distributed database decides that rather than sending the data over to the machine where the thread is running on, uh, it's uh, it's going to move the thread over to the machine where the data is. Uh, so when you block and want to read the data, actually what's going on is that your entire thread is now serialized uh, and gets awakened, and it continues from where, where it left off on a different machine. Another thing you can do with that is, for example, uh, uh, different uh, cloud providers give you something called serverless, uh, which means that instead of having uh, a server that's always on, um, you have uh, like a container that only gets created when there's an incoming request, and uh, it does some processing, uh, and then it gets t torn down. But what if part of that processing wants to access a different service, 
and that different service can take, I don't know, two seconds to respond. Uh, so instead of keeping that entire, uh, entire container up, and you're paying, you're paying for it, you can actually, while it's waiting, tear it down, and when the response comes back, uh, bring it back up again on another machine. This is stuff you can do with serialization. Of course, at least in Java, uh, we can't guarantee that serialization of threads would work, but we can't guarantee that a serialization of a, uh, an, uh, an object array would work, because it may point to some uh, non-serializable uh, object like a socket. But, uh, so at least in Java, it could fail at runtime. Uh, many, maybe other languages could give us some static guarantees. Um, but assuming that you have control over, your, over your, uh, what your threads do, uh, then this can work, and uh, it does in some experiments we've done. OK, so I mentioned that uh, we're going to add fibers and continuations. So first, I'm going to talk about continuations, and then um, show how the two uh, are, why the, the one depends on two. So a continuation is a piece of uh, sequential code, you can think of it as a runnable, that can choose to suspend itself. And the next time you run it, instead of starting afresh, it's going to continue from uh, where it last uh, stopped. So what's the difference between this and a thread? Um, so to give you an example, uh, here we have some runnable. Um, and it calls A. A does some printing. Uh, it calls B in the middle. And B says it wants to yield. Now, um, that name there, that A, gives it some context. You'll see what it means. But uh, continuation context can be uh, delimited uh, by some name, uh, which is uh, I call it a scope. It's like uh, an exception with a handler, and you can throw an exception to a specific to a specific uh, 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 try and count a specific uh, hand a specific exception handler, um, and you basically control which scope is going which scope is going to handle the exception. So the same thing is here, and you create a new continuation with that scope underscore a, uh, and you give it that runnable. So the first time you call run. Uh, it's going to call A, and A is going to print 111. Then it's going to call B, and B is going to yield a continuation. And uh, when you call it again, it's going to continue, uh, which means uh, B is going to return. Then it's going to print uh, 222. And so the difference between this and a thread is that everything runs in line. Okay? So it doesn't get executed somewhere else. It's not scheduled. So when you call run, so in place, uh, that runnable gets executed. It's just that it doesn't start afresh. It starts from wherever left off. Um, and continuations themselves, I'll show how they're used in fibers, but continuations themselves have some interesting uses. I think that 99% of their benefit would come from fibers. Uh, and here we're going to show some examples in decreasing order of utility. Uh, but one use of continuations that isn't in fibers and is, could be uh, nice to have is something called generators. So generators are like uh, iterables. Uh, that are imperative. Um, so you want to loop over some collection, and that collection is going to get generated on the fly by this code. Uh, and this code is allowed to sleep. It's allowed to call into I.O. Uh, but this collection of elements is generated lazily. So every time, so it blocks every time it produces, and every time you want to pull out another element, that, that's when it's going to continue. So it, it's not going to... Uh, call read line unless you ask for the third element. So that's one thing you can do in continuation. Another thing you can do, um, again, it's becoming less useful, um, is retriable exceptions. Uh, so think about uh, throwing an exception. Uh, you want to handle the exception. And then you want to jump back to where the exception occurred and try again. Uh, so for example, you, can, um, have some, you have some code here that finds a file and then writes to it. And in the exception handler, uh, you say, OK, if we got a, a file not found exception, we're going to create it, and then we're going to retry. So if uh, find file fails, uh, we're going to, this handler is going to get called, but then it's going to jump back in uh, and uh, going to write to the file that has just been created. Uh, finally, and this is, this is where things become uh, really crazy, uh, this may be familiar to people who know uh, Scheme. Um, you can have something called uh, ambiguous values. Uh, I am just going to give you some uh, intuition for how this works. But basically, what this code means is this. 
the value of A is either 1, 2, or 3. The value of B is 2, 3, or 4, but we don't know what it is. And later on in the program, we assert that B is less than A. Okay, so the only uh, possible way this could happen is if B is 2, right, and A is 3. Uh, and when we return B, it's going to return 2. So how does it know that? Uh, it's going to run until it hits this assertion, and uh, if the assertion fails, it's going to retry, it's going to jump back to the beginning and retry with different values. Uh, in order to do that, you're going to need uh, the ability to, so if, if you uh, remember where you are in the continuation, uh, you want to be able to uh, uh, restart it many times from the same point. Uh, and uh, basically you need to clone the continuation uh, with the yield point and return to it. Uh, but again, uh, this, I don't know if this is uh, the kind of thing you want to see in Java, but just to give you a feeling for what continuations uh, can do, uh, and in fact, uh, let's call it mathematically continuations have the same expressivity as, as monads, except that they uh, compose much better uh, in fact, they compose. Monads don't really compose. Uh, it's just So this is an example. Here you have uh, a generator that produces, like, like, a, like I showed you before, produces values, but it produces ambiguous values. And then here you uh, consume the values, and you assert, after you consume them, you assert that all the values are even. Uh, and when you run this, both, both continuations are going to do their, their work, and it's only going to consume even values, so the first value is going to be 2, the second value is going to be 10, uh, and it's going to return 12. So this is, uh, continuations are very, very, very powerful. You can do crazy stuff with them. But the most important thing we want to do with them, and that's where we get most of the benefit, is uh, lightweight threads. So a thread, not just fibers, but a thread in the uh, OS itself, is just a continuation as a schedule and a scheduler. So instead of saying uh, continuation, please please continue here, uh, a thread just says um, scheduler. Here is a continuation. It's runnable, so it's ready to run because it was waiting for something. Now it's ready to run. Please uh, assign it to some CPU core uh, and run it when you have the the, the CPU. And like I said, we already have uh, a great scheduler in Java. So the idea is that fibers would be implemented in pure Java on top of continuations, and the J JVM is just going to supply continuations. Of course, for serviceability, the, we want to uh, debug and step through fibers as we do through ordinary threads, and we want to be able to uh, uh, profile them like uh, ordinary threads. So the, at least the serviceability part, we'll have to know about threads, but uh, the lightweight threads are fibers. But other than that, fibers are going to be implemented in pure Java um, using continuations and the fork joint pool. Um, yeah, so assuming we have a continuation, how do we implement a fiber? So like I said, a fiber is literally just a continuation as a, and a scheduler. Uh, parking a fiber is just yielding the continuation uh, and telling it that the type of, the type of continuation is, is a fiber. Uh, that's because we can have, inside the fiber, we can have another, like a, like a generator, uh, a nested continuation. So we say we want to suspend the continuation of the fiber scope. Um, so uh, this means we're yielding the fiber scope, and park is just a yield. Unpark uh, basically uh, just sends this continuation to the scheduler for execution. Uh, and that's how you implement the thread once you have continuations. Um, yes, yeah, so a question so far. Uh, if you have. Yes. So, uh, so the, uh, uh, Gil asks, or said, rather, that all blocking is done through park and unpark. Uh, we are not going to support any native kind of blocking, which means that all the old I.O. In the, in the JDK is going to get rewritten uh, to use park and unpark. Uh, any more questions? OK. So uh, one of the questions that often come up is, uh, what about? Uh, uh, Kernel threads have the ability to do uh, forced preemption or time slice based preemption, which means that even if you never block an IO or a lock or some kind of synchronization, uh, the kernel can say, well, you've run for, I don't know, 100 milliseconds, I'm going to forcefully preempt you. 
uh, this may be necessary for lightweight threads. Uh, and if it is, uh, then we can add it uh, using the save point mechanism. So we have some places where we can say, okay, let's check something like a timer and preempt. But uh, it may not be necessary for the following reason. If you have uh, a thread that does, just does a lot of computations, inverting a huge matrix, uh, you can just use the OS scheduler and use a heavyweight thread because it's available to us, unlike in Erlang, say. Um, so, and on the other hand, if you have a, mil you know, if you have a, a million lightweight threads and all of them consume so much CPU that they need to be forcefully preempted, uh, then you're probably under-provisioned anyway uh, because you're by a factor of a million maybe. Um, so that doesn't really help. And if you have a million fibers that some of them occasionally use the CPU for a bit longer, uh, then the scheduler is going to take care of it automatically. It's just going to steal it's just going to steal jobs. Uh, so it is very likely that force preemption is just not necessary for, for lightweight threads. But if it is, uh, we can add it. OK, so I mentioned that all the serviceability is going to be, need to become aware of, uh, of these lightweight threads. Um, Java Util Concurrent, uh, I may have a slide for that. Yeah, maybe later. Java Util Concurrent is actually quite easy if we reuse the same, the same thread class for both lightweight and heavyweight threads, uh, we need to do absolutely nothing. Uh, maybe change a few constants. Uh, if we use uh, some like a if we use different classes um, for lightweight threads and heavyweight threads, uh, then we add an abstraction on top of them, and we just rewrite Java Util Concurrent to use that abstraction, so it's agnostic to whether uh, the the thread that's waiting on the lock is heavyweight. Or lightweight. One of the uh, big questions we do have is what to do about uh, the native synchronization, uh, the monitors synchronize an object. Wait, um, we would like to explore the possibility of uh, releasing like uh, an early version that does not support this. So if you uh, if you do object wait or you uh, you do some I/O inside syn uh, synchronize. Uh, not just the fiber would get blocked, but the entire uh, kernel thread that's underneath it. Um, and I would like to hear your opinion about this, how useful it's going to be. Uh, later on, we'd want to, of course, support them uh, that if you synchronize or wait, then uh, just the fiber um, gets this scheduled. Is it really that hard to do it? Uh, I don't know yet. That's <laughs> but if it is, then we m this is something that we may put off. OK, so uh, now we get to uh, the implementation hotspot. Uh, we don't know too much. We have more questions than answers at this point. But some things to keep in mind. These, these are like the requirements. So we want millions of continuations. So remember, you can have a few, maybe 1 million, 100,000, 1 million fibers. But uh, like I, like I showed you before, there, there could be even lighter weight continuations like generators, and you could have many millions of those. So we want them to have a very low RAM overhead, so that's one hard requirement. And the other one, uh, that's what we're here for, is the fast task switching. Uh, and this means that um, th the way the continuation works, when it suspends itself, it needs to preserve its state. And the state of a continuation is its, program, its current program counter, wh where it is in the program, and its current stack. Uh, so we need to uh, keep the stack somehow. Um, and when we execute a continuation, uh, this stack gets mounted onto uh, an actual kernel thread for execution. That's the only way for Java to access the CPU, to schedule something to the CPU, to mount something uh, on a thread. Uh, but this mounting and unmounting of continuations uh, needs to be very fast. This means that we like to avoid copying uh, bits of stack from the thread stack to some external storage and back. Uh, we want it to be just some pointer. Uh, so these are the requirements. So some ideas we've had so far. Uh, we can have those stacks behave just like ordinary thread stacks with very few modifications to the JVM. Uh, in this case, it would support native methods. Uh, but we don't really need to. 
uh, and do some, uh, you know, rely on the virtual memory, but the RAM overhead is going to be high, uh, so this is something I'm probably not going to do. Um, another suggestion is to use uh, part of the C heap uh, divided into constant size, something called stacklets. And those are constant size, and they're linked. So the stack is going to be like a linked list of these pieces. Uh, and, and this means that the pieces themselves will, will never get moved, but another piece may be linked to your current stack or removed. Um, but it's kind of hard to resize it, to, to, to size it well. Uh, so either the, the pieces are going to be too big or too small. Um, but the two ideas that so far we like is something uh, that John named uh, horizontal stacks, which basically means take the continuation stack and store it inside some Java object, uh, like a, an array. Um, and then we have great control over the RAM usage. The overhead is very small. Uh, managing it is going to be done by the existing GCs. But uh, this means that our work in the VM uh, may need to be specialized and, and become harder. And uh, that Java array, because it contains a stack, would contain both references and primitives. And the locations of the primitives and references would change based on how methods make use of them. So we need like uh, special OOP maps for them. Another idea is ex do we, oh, and, and so they're contiguous. And what happens, so when you create a continuation, it would get uh, a very small si uh, uh, size of stack. I guess it could be a, a, a constructor parameter saying how much stack, initial stack you want. But if you run out of it, uh, then it does the exact same thing as array list does. It would allocate a new array of double the size and, and copy it over uh, in terms of amortized cost. It, it's basically free. Um, the last idea is doing exactly the same. So contiguous stacks that when you run out of them, uh, you allocate one double the size and copy them over. But instead of being in, on the Java heap, they're in some portion of the C heap. Uh, so again, we get good, very low RAM overhead. Uh, but we need to find some way to manage it, which we hope it's not going to be as bad as writing a whole new GC. So the, the question was about interleaved. Uh, so this is actually my next slide. Um, no, sorry, it's the one after that. So the question is about interleaved Java and native calls. Um, I think that's my next one, so I'm going to get back to it. But uh, if we store stacks on the heap, we have uh, two different layouts. So I mentioned before that the, we're gonna, so, uh, the one I mentioned before is, is the one on the right. Uh, we have a single array. The, the layout of the stack is exactly as it is uh, for ordinary threads. Uh, but then some of the uh, some of the places in the array contain references. Some of them are natives. And we need some OOP map for that. Uh, another option is to keep the stack uh, in two separate arrays, one for primitives, one for references, in which case the GC doesn't need any change at all. But of course, then the generated compiler code and the interpreter will need to work differently whether the method is running in a continuation or not in a continuation. Uh, when it comes to uh, native calls, uh, so what we do is this. Um, let me start first in a simple way. Let's assume that we're actually calling some JNI method uh, that is not blocking. Uh, if it's blocking an IO, there's not much we can do. We generally we say we don't, we don't support it uh, in continuations. Um, so what we do is we leave the continuation stack, we go back to the thread stack, we run that code there, and because we know it doesn't block, I mean, we're promised it doesn't block, uh, when it returns, so it cleans up the stack and we return to the continuation. Uh, there are a few cases of native code that we do want to allow blocking, uh, and there are very few of them. In fact, I know of two. One is reflections, reflection. Uh, so you want to be able to uh, reflectively call a Java method that does some uh, fiber blocking I/O, uh, and we do want to support that. So you have the, so you still have this this, and, and the the reflections implemented as a, as a native VM method, and so it's still going to be on the stack when the continuation uh, suspends. So uh, we would 
uh, just handle it especially. Uh, another case is the um, um, the privilege, like do privilege. Uh, so because we have so few of these special cases, we just handle them especially somehow. Uh, for example, write a special frame on the continuation saying this was a reflective call. Uh, so when we resume it, we know how to rebuild. But these are uh, there are a few special cases that we need support for storing native calls on the continuation stack, and they're going to be handled especially. But other than that, all native code that gets called from inside a continuation, we assume it doesn't block, um, and we go back to, to the thread stack. Uh, I think, yeah, and one thing we may be able to make use of is we know that those continuation stacks, they're mutated only when they're mounted, only when they're executing. Right? Only when we call uh, continuation.run or when the scheduler calls continuation.run in one of, the, one of uh, its worker threads, uh, only when there are actual methods executing in it, that's when it's mutated. When it's unmounted, so when it's blocked, uh, it's basically uh, immutable. So uh, we can treat it as if it were a stack while it's mounted as a, some sort of an immutable object when it's dismounted. Uh, and that's it, yeah. Yeah. Right. So we assume. So uh, the question is, what, what happens if you have like, uh, a native method that calls back into Java? So he said. Um, so first of all, we assume that except for those special cases like reflection, uh, all native methods are leaf methods. They don't call back into Java. If they do, so one big example is um, sta uh, 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 class in initialization. So you load a class, and a lot, uh, and what I think we're going to do is, so if a native method that is not reflection, is not one of those special cases, uh, goes back to this uh, to this actual native thread, uh, and calls back into Java, uh, the Java is going to continue executing on the ordinary uh, thread, and it will not be able to block the continuation. So you can't yield a continuation inside stack initialization. I think it's not a a, a big restriction. Um, yeah, <laughs> again, another thread. Yeah, uh, but the the thing is that all of this is part of warm up or occasional work, and the whole idea is that. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether whether something is rare or not. The question is, if you have a, mil a million fibers, how often that's going to happen? If it happens like all the time, that that really affects your concurrency then you're in trouble either way. Uh, the only question is, what happens if momentarily you pin a continuation to the thread and the thread cannot continue unless some blocking operation terminates? And if that happens uh, relatively infrequently, then the scheduler is powerful enough to take it to you know, steal, steal jobs and tasks and do. Or that, yes, yes. It's a really good schedule. <laughs> No, reflection is going to get, so no, no, ref, we are going to support blocking in a, a reflective call, and that's going to be fine. That's not going to go over here. Uh, that, that's a special case. It's just that so far we found two or three of these special cases, and, and we can handle them. Uh, the assumption is that it's rare. Uh, you will not be able to write your own JNI method that calls back into Java, and that Java code would try to block. Uh, you will not be able to do that. Only the special cases in the VM. Uh, like reflection, a couple more. The the bytecodes themselves don't preempt. It's, yeah, it's just a call to. So. Um, 
the assumption is that at least initially, all blocking would get down, uh, would get done. It's not entirely um, cooperatively, but when you block on a on a lock or an IO, um, so when when it translates eventually to a call to to yield, uh, if we need to do uh, time slice based preemption, force preemption, then we do that at safe points. We, we don't want to do it at any point unless we do forced uh, preemption and that would get done at safe point. So we, we already have that. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you.